our national game and in your local team. And now out to Kaminsky Park and Hal Totten, who is going to give us some inside information on today's game right from the playing field. Take it away, Hal Totten. The White Sox, Chicago, where the White Sox and the Philadelphia Athletics are going to play the fourth and final game of this present series. Right now, there's a man here that oh, it looks, it looks like they want to get a picture of this, Tony. Come on up one step here. These young ladies here have got a camera and want to get a picture of us on the microphone, which is all right. I'm going to make the camera, Al. I don't think we will. Uh, Tony, uh, this is Tony Pyle, ladies and gentlemen. I really didn't have time to tell you who it was until we had to start posing for uh, cameras over here. Tony is now a third baseman. Last time we had him on the air, he was a second baseman. So, uh, Tony, I want to ask you some questions about that. When... Uh, you were on before. You said, didn't you, that second base has been your position regularly ever since you started playing? Well, yes, I have played second base more, but I think I can play third base as well if I play long enough. Well, I know you play it very well. Whether you play long enough or not, you look like an old trooper out there. But uh, you played some of that up there in the International League last year, didn't you? Well, well, yes, I have played a few games. Is this the fellow that bounces along alongside you out there? Yeah, old Lucius much. Luke, huh? That's right. <laughs> I played a little uh, with the Reds. I think I, think I played about 50 games to third base in 1934 with the Reds. That gave me a pretty good idea about third base, but still is, I have a lot to learn. Well, what, are, what is the chief difference you find between those two positions? Well, I haven't played third base much this year, and I think it's all in the throwing. Finally that. Huh? The arm has uh, got to be uh, rebuilt all over again. On di uh, the different muscles put into use. That's all there is to it, Hal. Well, the throw from second base is mostly on underhand. I That's right. That this is more of an overhand throw, and of course it's a uh, the uh, ball comes at you in a different angle, and I've got to learn to hit her, so, and Jimmy's been a great help to me. He uh, sort of moves you around, does he, in and out? He does. Uh, back and forth. Uh, do you mind going in after those bunts? Well, <laughs> they haven't been buttoned much, but I believe I can make them. If I'm just daring them to bunt, that's all. <laughs> just dare them to it. You'll be in there charging them. That's anyway. right. I'll be. I'll be uh, well, even at that, over there at second base, sometimes some of these fellas, a few fellas are still drag bunts to sort of pull them down where you got to come over and get them. That's about nearly the same as a bunt, only the throws a little shorter. It's more of a flip. I see. From second. From second, yeah. Uh, outside of the throw, though, you find... Uh, that uh, it's approximately the same course for fly balls, I suppose it is. You've got to take foul balls here and fly it off this grandstand a little bit. But then you do that from second base over the other side. You do that as well over at second base. Uh, of course, uh, does the, the ball come at you? What do you mean when you said it came at you at different angles? Well, you don't see the ball as, uh, uh, as you do at second base. The ball kind of just flies off the bat, especially a left-hand hitter. It just comes at you before you know it. Uh, and it's, uh, well, that's why they call it a hot corner, Hal. I see another, well, I get it. In other words, you've got to really start a little quicker. Is that it? Yeah, you just got to get the knack of uh, where, which way the ball will uh, go to you, right or to your left. And most of them going down there are curving more than they are out there second base, really, too, aren't they? Yeah, they sometimes the left-hand hitter slices the ball, and, and you've just, if you play the third base long enough, you'll be able to tell whether the ball will go two or three feet to either side of you. But uh, you've got to get used to the uh, vision of it. That's the knack of playing third base only. Uh, it looks, uh, looks a little bit as though you got that bat swinging good again. You got a little slump there for a while, didn't you? Oh, well, I Those things happen. I know. Uh, <laughs> all ball players have them, but uh, I just probably had one for too long of a period. Well, I think there's several fellas on the club, this club and every other club they have. I've seen them all up and down the line. They get them every year, and uh, when it's all over, it's all over. Well, uh, I'll, I'll be glad to be in a slump all year if we could just keep winning ball games. Well, that's right, too. Well, Tony, I imagine you want to dry off a little. You've been out there getting all full of perspiration, and uh, I want to thank you a lot for stopping here and chatting with us. Wish you a lot of luck at your new job, and uh, that fella Dykes deserves a rest, and you're giving him a good one and not making him worry about it, which is okay. All right, Al, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Tony Pyatt, ladies and gentlemen, the present third baseman of the White Sox, early part of the year, the second baseman of the club, chatting with us a little bit about this, that, and other things, and I hope you were very much interested in what was going on. And now, let's give you the lineup for the ball game today. For Philadelphia, Finney, left, Moses, center, Dean, first, Puccinelli, right, Johnson, second. Higgins, third. Frank Hayes, catching. Newsom, short. And Rhodes, pitching. For the White Sox, Radcliffe, left. Cleavich, center. Haas, right. Benura, first. 
Appling, short. Hayes, second. Pyatt, third. Sewell, catching. And Kennedy, pitching. Kennedy. Vernon Kennedy will be the pitcher. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start a little trek up there to the booth, possibly a little bit earlier than at some times, because I want to chat with a certain young man that I saw here in the stands on the way up. I might add, though, that it's another one of those days that, well, you sort of dream about out here. Perfect sunshine, but a nice cool breeze off the lake blowing in from the north. Uh, what do you got there, Teddy? Oh, a brand new potato. Old Teddy Lyons managed to sneak a brand new potato from somebody, and he's going to have it autographed for somebody. He's going to send that back to Opelousa. I mean, where is that place down there you live? Vinton, Louisiana. Is that where it's going? It is, eh? And, uh... How did you get, who'd you sneak that on? Billy Webb, or did you just sneak it? Oh, he gave you that one. Oh, two of your... <laughs> okay, Teddy Lyons would give all you're just beaming all over. He had a brand new ball to get autographed. Okay, you people that ask for baseballs have no idea how tough it is to get them. And as a matter of fact, the uh, ball players have a tougher time. Now listen, Merv. <laughs> Merv Shea gonna pull my trouser leg off. That's bad. The ball players themselves have a tougher time getting them than most of the fans do, or friends of the fans, or somebody like that. They have to sort of big borrower steal them, otherwise maybe they'd have one every day. But on this perfect day with the breeze blowing in, nice, cool, sun out, nice and warm, making about an even possibility, all right, I think probably we'd better start upstairs, and as we make that trek up there to the booth, Uncle George, how about a little switch to the studio? Attention motorists, too many of you are digging down into your pockets to pay over and over again for motor oil. An extra quart now, a couple of more quarts a few hundred miles later, constantly refilling the crankcase. You'll be glad to know that your Texaco dealer has an entirely new motor oil that will positively cut down your oil consumption. Use the need to have carbon removed and protect your engine longer against wear and tear. The new Texaco motor oil, made by the Perfurol process, provides a newer, tougher lubricating film that resists burning up inside the engine. It puts more miles between the quarts you buy. With the new Texaco motor oil, your car will not be oil thirsty. Perfurol is a special refining material. When oil is treated with Perfurol, a stronger lubricating film results. This Perfurol film acts like a protective wrapping for each of the moving parts of your engine. It lubricates better for many extra miles, providing greater, more complete engine protection. From the minute you fill the crankcase of your car with the new Texaco motor oil, you begin saving real money. You still pay only a quarter a quart, but you get greater mileage between those quarts. So change now at any Texaco station to this tougher, longer-lasting oil with a Perfurol film. Make your driving dollars go further. And now for a look at the... Well, I see we have some time for that. I see that Hal Totten is ready, and we'll go back to Comiskey Park to the baseball game brought to you by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Philadelphia Athletics to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. Take it, Hal Totten. Am I on the air, George? Don't tell me I'm on the air. Well, being on the air, I'm on the air. Better talk on the air. So in that case, why, uh, we went to the fact that the, the umpires have finished their conference at the plate and taking their positions out there in the field. Umpire Quinn behind the plate, umpire Hubbard on first base, and Bill McGowan, her old buddy, out there at third. Bill McGowan, I might add, is one of the discoveries and admits it, and is very proud of it, of baseball writers. Baseball writers introduced Bill McGowan into the American League. So many, many years ago, the Yankees were coming north, and they're playing a lot of games, and they picked up one of the teams, I don't remember which one, uh, to play some games with, and as they went along, they uh, had umpire McGon with him. He was just a youngster, but they liked his ambitions and his hustle, and the baseball writers went back to New York, and they called Ben Johnson, and they kept it Ben until he hired him. And now we have here the fellow who, not only to the observers, but also to the ball players themselves, is the finest umpire or one of the, of course, we can't say that, but the ball players voted him the best umpire in the league from a ball player's point of view, but he's by far one of the finest umpires that the game has known. And he has sort of taken 
this little fellow Quinn under his wing. Quinn, the boy who was with him and who had a bad year last year, but has come along in grand shape this year to become another great umpire. And by nursing with him, talking baseball with him, and otherwise putting himself out if necessary to satisfy his thirst for knowledge of just how to handle this job, he's made a great umpire out of him. I think he's going to develop also into a final. Hubbard, the youngster, that is out here. Is uh, also coming along fine. Well, for the fourth day in a row, Finney goes after the first ball, pitch to him, hits the ground ball down to the second baseman, and is thrown up. So his percentage is 50-50. In the opening game and in the third game of the series, he hit the first ball pitch and made base hits. In the second game and again in this game, he was out on that first pitch. And so it's one out of the first inning for the outbreak. And Wally Moses, the center fielder up there, bunts the first one, but it's fouled to the left plate. And Fyatt comes in to get it, but there's no play because it was outside. And it's strike one. Ball is going back out to Kennedy, the pitcher. And uh, starts to wind up, throws the next one. It's inside and low for ball one. So the county is one and one. One ball and one strike. On Moses. And there's ball two. It's inside and low. You remember Kennedy started the first game of the series here and lost it. He was very wild. And eventually things went very badly, although the Sox ended up tying up the score. Didn't do an awful lot of good. Now he reaches out the butt again, and this one goes foul clear over to the Sox dugout. And so it's two and two, two balls and two strikes. Pitch the hitter swing, did a little looping fly in left field. Radcliffe comes in fast and can't get to it, and it drops in there for a base hit. Little looping technical leaguer into left field for a single for Moses, putting him on first base with one out in the first inning, and Chubb Dean, the first baseman, is back. Throws the first one, the runner's on the go. The hitter takes it inside and low, and the runner slides in safely. And he got a great start on that ball. Moses, as I have mentioned time and again in this series and in other series, one of the fastest men in the game, and he got a great jump on the ball that time. Easily stole second. Sewell got the throw away very well, very fast. He still got out there in a hurry. While it was a little bit high, uh, still, the runner was in there to the base long before it arrived. Long speaking in the sense of comparative time because naturally those plays happen fast. Now Dean hits the next one, a ground ball to Appling, who gets it, throws the third, and Fyatt tags the runner out, sliding in there for the second out. Moses kept right on to third base. Appling got the ball through it to Fyatt, who just merely put the ball down there and let Moses slide right into it for the second out. So it's two out. In the first inning for the Athletics, Dean on first base, and George Puccinelli, the Athletics right fielder, is at bat. He throws the first one, and George takes a fast strike over the outside corner about knee high. One strike on Puccinelli. And there's the next one wide and low for ball one, and the count is one ball and one strike. One and one on the Pooch. As he's signed again, turns and throws the first. The runner gets back in plenty of time. Oh, the ball comes back to the pitcher. He has it, looks at first, then pitches. And the hitter swings and hits a high fast ball inside for strike two. And it's one ball and two strikes on Puccinelli. One and two the count. <clears throat> Now that the runner on the golf pooch falls this one into the stands to the right of the plate. Well, it lands just short, short of the stands over there. And it's still one ball and two strikes on Puccinelli. The 
don't think that was a hit and run play. I think Pooch just swung the, to cover to protect the runner when he thought the runner didn't get away soon enough and fouled off a bad ball because they'd hardly put the hit and run on with a count of one and two unless they were pretty sure some reason to be sure the pitcher. They did it again. The hitter hit the ground ball down to Pyatt who starts to throw to second, sees that there's nobody there, so turns and throws to first. Throw is wide, but Benura grabs it and then blocks the runner off and tags him out. The ball was well hit, and Pyatt grabbed it, running over towards second. He thought it would be a good play, I guess, to get the man a second because he was running in that direction. And that short throw is a throw more accustomed to what he has been used to at second base. There was nobody there, so he turned and threw wide to first. And Benura, reaching way out to the left, grabbed the ball down low and had it in plenty of time to block Puccinelli off. So it's no runs, one hit, one man left on base in the first half of the first inning. And the score is nothing to nothing as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the first inning with Rip Radcliffe, as usual, the first man at bat. Dusty Rhodes, originally when I first knew him, he was with the New York Yankees. He didn't stay there long, went to the Boston Red Sox, was with them for quite a while, and came to the A's last winter in the deal, one of the numerous deals between the Athletics and the Red Sox. <coughs> and he's been pitching some pretty good ball for this club. But this, I think, is his first appearance in Chicago this year. And a rather stockly built fellow, dark complected, and very handsome. The better for you, young ladies. Pitch the weights out there now, get your sign. Suck is wind up to pitch the first one to Radcliffe, stocky little left handed hitter. And Rip Slings hit it out to the shortstop, who takes it on a great big long hop, throws the first. And Rip is out easily for the first out in the first inning. One off. And Mike Creevy is up there. Rosenthal still has the handicap of that twisted back and he twisted running down to first base yesterday. So Mike has been moved over to his center field field spot. And Haas is back here in right. And the first pitch to Kriewicz is a wide one low for ball one. Kriewicz is a right-handed hitter. Rhodes has his sign again, starts to wind up. Throws, and Mike reaches out the butt, one down towards third base. Higgins comes in fast, grabs it. Throws very high to first, but Dean Lee tying there to grab it. Kriewicz, in the meantime, having crossed first base easily. So it's a base hit, safe front. Down the third baseline by Kravich, putting him on first base with one out in the first inning for the White Sox, and Mule Haas is at bat. So ready to pitch the first one throws, and Mule takes the ball, it's inside and low. One ball called. Rhodes has the sign and pitches and mule swings hit a ball right straight back at the second baseman who fumbles it and by the time he gets to the ball the runner is safe at first base on an error by Hayes an error by or rather not by Hayes but an error by Johnson and rather an easily hit ball too right straight at him took a high hop but he didn't follow it at all So now the White Sox have runners on first and second with one out in the first inning, and Zeke Manura is at bat. Well, it's the first player that we have seen that Johnson hasn't looked good on in his transplanted position in this series. First pitch to Zeke is a wide one across the waist for ball one. The way it's there again, swings around as he gets his sign. He's ready. And pitches and Zeke takes ball two. It's wide across the chest and makes it two and nothing. Mm 
Two and nothing, two balls and no strikes. But you're ready again. Throws and Zeke twists away to take the third ball inside across the waist to make it three and nothing, three balls and no strikes on Zeke. Still got our symphony orchestra out here, George. Hear the whistle? <laughs> You're ready once more. Takes another look back at second. Throws. And it's a strike over the heart of the plate, a little above the knees. Zeke let it go by without trying for it. So it's three and one, three balls and one strike. And again, the pitcher throws. Zeke gets the ball hard in the center field. But the center fielder, Moses, is in there to make the catch for the second out. Runners have to go back to their bases. Ball was very hard hit, a line smash, center field, but it was right straight at Moses, the center field. So it's two out in the first inning for the White Sox. They still have runners on first and second, and Luke Appling is at bat. Swings around, he gets his sign, gets ready to pitch. Throws. And it's a strike over the outside corner about knee high. One strike on Appling. Rhodes ready again. Takes another look back at second. And throws. Luke swings. The bat flips out of his hand. Goes clear out to the pitcher's box. As the ball goes down to the third baseman. And Luke is safe. And Rhodes is mad and throws the bat clear out of the infield. Just misses umpire. Quinn down there, Rhodes is so sore because in hitting that ball, a bat flipped out of Appling's hand, rolled out to the pitcher's box. Rhodes stood there, watched it come out there, and let it roll up on his feet. And then he was mad and flung it clear off the mound and out into foul territory as Appling beat out the ball for an infield hit. Now the White Sox have the bases full with two out in the first inning. And it's a wide one across the knees for ball one. One ball called. Rose walks up to the dirt in front of the mound, moves it down a little bit. Walks back out there, adjusts his cap. Now starts to wind up. He throws and Jackie Hayes. The bat falls the ball back against the catcher's glove and back to the screen. And it's one and one on Hayes. One ball and one strike. One and one is the count, but she throws again, and Jackie swings to miss one for strike two. And it's one and two, one ball and two strikes. One and two. Waiting out there again, seems to be getting his sign. Takes a look at third base, starts his wind up. And pitches, and Jackie hits the ball out in the left center. I think it's going to fall in there. It is for a base hit. One run is in, the ball is coming into the plate as the second runner scores, and the other runners advance to second and third with Hayes coming in pretty hard and almost falling over as he tries to come up on his feet. It's a single. Mexico Leaguer, too, by Kraken. Well, those Mexico Leaguers can drive in those runs, can't they? Single to left center by Hayes. Scored Kivic and Haas for the first two runs of the ball game, both unearned runs because the error... If it hadn't been made, would have made it the third out when Venura flied out. And runners are on second and third with two out, two runs home in the first inning. And Tony Pyatt is at bat. He winds up, throws the first one, and Pyatt twists away. Big ball inside across the chest. He's all set to go after that one, too. Throws again, and Pryor takes the strike over the heart of the plate, waist high. And the count is one and one. One ball and one strike on Pryor. Rhodes throws again, and Tony swings and follows the ball back against the mass and rolls out into the infield 
And the catcher goes out to get it, looks it over as he comes back. Umpire Quinn has thrown another ball into the game, calls for that one, and I think he's going to throw it out. Catcher Hayes had looked it over and indicated it should be yes. Quinn, after a look at it, throws it out of the game. The umpires, you know, are the only ones authorized to do that. And uh, umpire Quinn, who followed the rules, had to examine it to make sure that it really was improper for use. It's one and two, one ball and two strikes. And the pitcher throws again. The hitter started to swing, stop. The ball hit the bat and rolled over there. But And the catcher started to go after the fan, reached into the stands to, and grabbed it. And the catcher walks back without it. I don't think the catcher knew whether that ball had been tipped foul or not. He thought maybe it might have been a pass ball. Went chasing over after it, and both Dean and Rhodes came rushing into cover. The umpire had called it a foul and strike. So it's still one and two on plant. One ball and two strikes. Once again, the pitcher has that side, starts to wind up throws, and Tony takes a wide one across the knees for ball two. Couch has started to run toward the bench, though he thought that was a called third strike. Rhodes made a half-hearted start toward the bench, but takes the ball and goes back out the mound. The count is two balls and two strikes on Pyatt. Two and two the count. Winding up again, throws, and Pyatt gets ball three. It missed the outside corner up around the chest, and it makes it three and two. Three balls and two strikes on Pyatt. White Sox have runners on second and third with two out, two runs home, and they're leading the Athletics two to nothing in the first inning. Rhodes winds up, throws again, and Pratt gets ball four. Wide and low, he gets the base on ball. So that fills the bases for the White Sox in the first inning. Two out, two runs already home, base is full, and Luke Sewell is back to score two to nothing in favor of the White Sox. Rhodes starts to wind up pitches, and it's a high one inside for ball one. One ball on Sewell. It's winding up again. He throws and looks, swings, and fouls the ball back against the umpire's mask this time. Bounds way out against the stand of the left plate. Meyer Quinn merely adjusts the mask. It took quite a bump, and he turns around, calls to somebody to... He's called the announcer, I guess. He's going to need some more baseballs in a minute. It's one and one. One ball and one strike. And Sewell gets the second strike. A beauty over the heart of the plate down around the knees to make it one ball and two strikes on Sewell. One and two. Winds up again, throws, and Sewell swings and misses, striking out for the third out in the first inning. Went around on a ball that didn't look as though it had a thing on it, but he didn't hit it. So it must have had something after all. That ends the last half of the first inning. So it's two runs, three, four hits. Wait a minute, one, two, three hits. One error, and three men left on B. And the score is two to nothing in favor of the White Sox at the end of the first inning. Motor oil has more than one job to do. It must lubricate all the moving parts of the motor, it must seal the power in the cylinder, and it must help to keep moving parts cool. There is one way you can be absolutely sure that the motor oil in your car is doing a complete job. Use nothing but new Texaco motor oil. Bob Johnson, rangy right-handed hitter, the athletic second baseman, with that to start the second inning. Kennedy winds up, throws. Bob swings to call the ball back onto the roof of the stand, right up back of the plate, and it's one strike on Johnson. One strike to count. He 
There's a ball inside across the way, so the count is one ball and one strike. One and one on Johnson. And now comes ball two. It's over the plate, but too low. So it's two balls and one strike on Bob. Two and one. Swings again to hit a high fly coming down far way back here. I believe it's on the roof. Yep. <laughs> right up over our heads. Found it clear out over and back down into 35th Street. Well, he swings again and it's a high fly going foul to the right of the plate. Sewell is following out under it toward the stand to the right and makes the catch for the first out in the second inning.